Hello, and welcome to the second installment of the fall lecture series hosted jointly by the Archaeological Society of Connecticut and the Friends of the Office of State Archaeology. As with our previous lectures, please either hold your questions until the end or ask them in the Q&A and chat feature. If you would like to ask a question after the talk, but do so verbally, please use the raise your hand feature and I can activate your microphone. But remember, you will be recorded and your camera may be on. Tonight, we are pleased to have with us Dr. Anthony Martin, a historical archaeologist at Central Connecticut State University. Dr. Martin received his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and has published his research in leading journals such as historical archaeology. Tonight, he will be discussing three generations of the Freeman family in Derby, Connecticut. And I'm going to uh, mute myself and all right. Well, good evening on this uh, chilly evening here in uh, Connecticut. Um, thank you to the ASC and the uh, Friends of Archaeology for inviting me to do this talk to um, uh, illuminate the years that CCSU and the uh, archaeology lab here, uh, the archaeology lab for African and African diaspora studies to Kind of show you some of the work uh, we've been doing here uh, in Connecticut. So thank you. I'm going to talk to you this evening about the three generations of the Freeman family uh, down in uh, Derby, Connecticut. The site is down in Osborndale uh, State Park and we started excavations there in 2010 and then returned every other year until 2018. But as I get started, I really I'd like to dedicate this to the memory of uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine Harris, who um, just passed away a few weeks ago. We wouldn't um, be where we are today without her help um, and kind of uh, breaking out for us what um, the Black Governor's War, especially here in Connecticut. So um, yes, I wanna dedicate this uh, to um, to uh, Dr. Harris, and uh, may she live on wherever she has gone. Uh, she's gone home. All right, so, um, and just a, a little bit about her. She was actually uh, a um, adjunct professor here at Central Connecticut State University, and she was one of the co-editors on this African uh, African American uh, Connecticut, uh, and she actually contributed five chapters out of this volume, and um, a lot of it was focused on uh, the Black governors uh, in uh, New England, and specifically. Uh, in, in Connecticut. So thank you, uh, Dr. Harris. Tonight I'm coming um, uh, broadcasting to you from the Anthro Department in Ebenezer Bassett Hall at Central Connecticut State University. He was the first African American to graduate from what would become Central Connecticut State University and was um, the first um, ambassador to uh, the country of Haiti. So Let's um, kind of do some uh, a little bit of background. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge a lot of people. Um, I've already talked about Dr. Catherine Harris, but the uh, uh, somebody that uh, I have taken over from one of my uh, mentors who um, has uh, groomed me over the years since I retired from the military in 2006, uh, Dr. Warren Perry, who headed up the uh, the archaeological team that did the excavations um, these uh, past few years. And he was out there every year from 2010 on. Uh, professor, uh, he has since retired. Uh, professor Jerry Sawyer, uh, who has also retired, was another one who uh, tirelessly worked at, uh, at this site. And then the lab coordinator, uh, Janet Woodruff, who is still uh, um, uh, here at CCSU today. And a lot of other people that I do want to acknowledge too, from our intern, Kayla, who has been helping um, with the um, catalog, the artifacts, and helping with uh, the uh, getting a, a display here on the fourth floor in Bassett Hall. And she's also assisted, uh, as well as Janet, with the Kellogg Environmental Education Center, uh, because they in, are also setting up their own um, uh, display down there in Osborndale State Park. 
the Cole, um, James Cole and family who were descendants of um, Quash Freeman, um, all the CCSU students and alumni, um, the ALADs and some of the people from the town, um, the um, Rob, Gabby and Allison Novak, um, Alina Sesma, who came out and uh, mapped the, the site for us uh, a few years ago. Uh, the, and then we had tremendous support, especially that first year from uh, the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts of Derby, the 4-H Club, uh, and the Historical Society, and all those volunteers who also came out. So thank you uh, to everybody that has helped with this project over the years. How I want to couch this uh, project is I want to couch it with the how the um, uh, cultural critic Bell Hooks, and uh, she doesn't capitalize her name, um, I want to couch this in a, a framework of home place, because that's what we have with the three generations of the Freeman family that are living, uh, that lived at this site, starting with uh, Quash Freeman and then his son, uh, Roswell, and then um, the um, Roswell's son, William Oliver, and their wives. Um, and I, I will highlight really Roswell's wife a lot because we know a lot more about uh, Nancy Freeman. But I want you to think um, when I talk about home place, because Bell Hooks says that this is one site where uh, and it's a political statement, especially during this time frame, because when we think of Connecticut at this time, William Lloyd Garrison once said that the Connecticut is the Georgia of New England. And when you think of some of the policies that are, uh, are going on in the state, you'll understand why. Very different from a state where I did my dissertation research in, in, in Massachusetts, whereas in Connecticut, um, they first had the right to vote, but then it's taken away from, um, from African-American males. Uh, schooling it was not, st uh, was not f um, uh, standardized across the state for um, people of color. So some areas you could get schooling, others you couldn't. People couldn't come into the state to, to get schooling. And then there were the, uh, the gradual emancipation laws. So uh, uh, the abolition of slavery in this state doesn't come about until 1848. So there are a lot of things that are going on in this, uh, um, this state that are kind of curtailing the freedoms. So surely when somebody establishes a, a, um, a home, uh, it's a political uh, act with your uh, resistance against the dominant culture. So this is, as she calls home place, one site where one could freely confront the issues of humanization, where one could resist. It was also a construction of a safe place where black people could affirm one another and by, do and by so doing heal many of the wounds inflicted um, by racist domination, okay? So home place, that's, that's how I want you to think about uh, this site. And here is uh, just a kind of a brief line and block chart, um, starting with Quash Freeman and his wife, Rose Freeman, and then Roswell Freeman, who marries Nancy Thompson. Uh, she was born, we do have um, kind of a, a, an approximate date on her, 1807. And then they have about 10 children, some of them die, uh, at least two die very early. Um, we'll talk about um, um, one of the children, uh, William Oliver, who um, uh, will take up residence uh, at the site uh, as well. So um, I won't, and this lining block chart doesn't show you who they are all married to, but just so um, to kind of keep it simple with the, for now with the three generations um, that are going on. So this is Connecticut, uh, this is um, 1824. So this is about the time that uh, uh, um, Quash is um, uh, a black governor down in Derby, uh, Connecticut, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail what black governors wore because a lot of people probably don't know what they are uh, here. In the yellow here is Derby. Um, so 
I, uh, this map, don't worry, it, it, it gets a, uh, a bit larger in other slides, and I'll uh, kind of do an overview of where, uh, um, where we excavated over the last um, 11 years by the different years of the CCSU um, slash ALADS field schools. All right. But let's talk a little bit about Black governors, uh, because a lot of people don't know them. First, though, I want you to understand that um, these, uh, the um, Negro Election Day has its roots in um, um, men's societies from West Africa. It's just called Negro Election Day because the, um, uh, the um, captive Africans uh, are using kind of the dominant cultures terms um, so that they can kind of hide uh, the events that are going on um, uh, during Negro Election Day. So it's a mask, uh, the Negro Election Day, because what happens is uh, there's a lot of festivities that go on during this time frame, from music to the dancing, parading, uh, wearing costumes, playing various games, uh, that and and. This uh, and um, playing of um, uh, uh, drums. So these celebrations, which some of the uh, some of the dominant culture gets involved in uh, as well, it's a prestigious position. Uh, it's not just ceremonial. It uh, has a, a judicial function where they will handle minor infractions that the um, uh, the captive African owners don't want to handle. And it's prestigious for owners to have their, uh, their um, uh, captives uh, as elected as um, a, a, a governor uh, in, in the state. And sometimes they give them clothes, um, their horse, uh, um, so that they could um, um, uh, uh, do their parading with, um, uh, with the help. And sometimes even some of the, um, some of the owners even um, contributed to laying out a spread. Um, the uh, literature that's out there a lot of times thinks, uh, or it's uh, from the time, um, where the dominant culture thinks that, oh, they're just mimicking us. But again, like I said, it's a mask um, that they're getting to display elements of African culture under this guise of uh, Negro uh, Election Day. Um, also, along with all the stuff that I listed, um, there's food that's uh, going on here. There's celebration. And um, the it will start in 1750 and go in Connecticut till uh, into the 1850s. And I once asked Dr. Harris uh, the when she came out uh, in 2012 to uh, at the end of the field school. Uh, I was doing my dissertation research at the time, and I knew that say in Massachusetts, um, the whole Negro Election Day. Was, um, was over, it had transitioned into other things, other types of celebrations um, by the early 19th century. And she explained to me, uh, well, remember Connecticut didn't, um, didn't abolish slavery till 1848. And that's why uh, these celebrations still go on. A governor was elected uh, for a one year term and it first starts in Hartford which shows you, and then people would have to go to Hartford to, um, to um, um, partake in the, in the festivities, which shows you that there is a, uh, a social connection that's going on with the, um, um, the captive population in, um, in Connecticut. And when I say black governors, they weren't um, called black governors everywhere. They were called um, black governors in Connecticut and Rhode Island, but uh, because those were colonies that elected uh, their governors. In Massachusetts and New Hampshire, they're called kings. And then when we go um, um, more to the West, down into New York and New Jersey, uh, the celebration is called Pinkster. And the, uh, one of the historians, um, um, Shane White, who has done research on Pinkster in New, New York and New Jersey. 
um, uh, links it also to um, the uh, festivals that are uh, that are going on, uh, and it talks about if you read between the lines of um, because yes, the the talk is is um, uh, by the dominant culture is um, um, derogatory and um, talking about mimicking. But he said, if you read between the lines, you could see and pull out the events that are going on in these, uh, um, in these festivals. And when you go um, to the Caribbean, um, and, um, the Caribbean, they actually um, have with carnival, they have kings and queens, uh, which didn't, uh, make it to North America. And you could see elements of it as well in uh, Mardi Gras in, uh, in New, or New Orleans. So why did they allow it? Well, Dr. Reedy, another um, uh, uh, authority on the um, celebration um, from um, Emancipation Day celebrations and Negro Election Day said that it was most likely allowed because it was a sm uh, and especially in New England because it's a small black population so it's not a threat and also uh, another reason it contributed to the social order of um, that allowed um, um, people to blow off steam and the other one it was um, used for its quasi legal system. Like I had said earlier, the judicial um, uh, um, function that little infractions owners just allowed the black governor to handle it. As I said, it starts in Hartford, but eventually other towns will pick it up. So Derby uh, does um, pick it up uh, as well. and. Here you can see, and this is not all of the black governors, and um, this is just some of them, so that you can get an idea of the places in Connecticut uh, where they're serving. Right. Some of a lot of what we know, and when I first showed this um, um, slide to you, and I'll show that picture again. The picture uh, is of Nancy Freeman. So she's Roswell's wife. And in the 19, in the 1890s, uh, Jane DeForest Shelton writes an article for Harper's uh, Monthly Magazine. Um, there is some derogatory and racist stuff that she's writing uh, because she uh, happens to be a product of her time. Um, but there are things that, um, you're able to, when you read this article where she's talking about Nancy and then she's describing the location of uh, the house that we will use to help locate it uh, in Osborndale uh, State Park. But uh, we do know that um, uh, Nancy um, will raise uh, probably about 10, 10 children sometimes, uh, it looks like there are more, but it, it, it gets confusing at times because sometimes the middle name is used uh, um, for um, for the child and it at times confuses it, but it looks like there are 10 children, two um, died uh, very early. Uh, the Nancy um, uh, was um, uh, a product of in early New England of what was called binding out, where when she was um, nine, uh, nine years old, she was bound out to a family, the Cole family in, um, uh, in Derby. She will stay with them for 10 years. And the, they offer her, you know, if you stay till you're 18, uh, we'll give you a pal. But if you stay in, until you're 19 for, uh, will give you a feather bed to go along with it. And so she decided, okay, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll stay and, and uh, to get my cow and my uh, feather bed because she's already thinking about the use of that cow. And then also I'll have a, a bed to sleep on. Being in the household for that long um, gives her a certain amount of um, kind of leverage over the uh, the family, and she's able to to tell uh, Mrs. Cole to make her address, 
and also bake some cakes uh, uh, and doesn't tell her that, hey, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I want you to do this because I'm, I'm getting married. Uh, so think about living in the house and for, those, for 10 years, uh, you're going to know things about the people in the house. And at times you can use that as leverage. The uh, interesting thing about binding out, and this is something that I found in my research as well in Massachusetts, is as and Massachusetts abolishes slavery by judicial decree and they, uh, in 1780, so a lot longer, even though a lot of people didn't get the word that, oh, you're actually free. But you could see in the early 19th century uh, and, uh, and there, as well as in Connecticut, where a lot of times women don't have a lot of opportunities, uh, African-American women, so they stay in these households as domestics. And we see that here with, um, with Nancy, what's going on uh, with her. The um, other things um, uh, that are in this uh, article that we can pull out, and, uh, and I'll show you when I bring the picture back up, is that uh, Shelton is talking about her dress. She's describing the house, the, the, the location of the house. But a lot of times, things that she kind of highlights is stuff that uh, um, she's showing a, a, um, in relation to the worth of what um, white Americans think about, um, like with the husband Roswell, where she calls him a fox hunter. Well, that was just one of the things he did. Not um, It wasn't kind of an everyday thing. He was a landowner and he was a farmer, uh, which she doesn't um, fully capture that uh, in the uh, in this article, and Nancy uh, raised turkeys. Uh, so um, when she goes out here to, for this interview uh, in the, the 1890s, Nancy is already in her 90s. Roswell passes away in 1877, and um, so let's um, the picture that um, these pictures were taken by uh, Helen Smith. This one is donated to the, um, uh, the Derby uh, Public Library by um, a Mrs. John Hurley. We think that these pictures might have been taken the same day because they probably, and maybe um, Helen Smith went up there with her to, to take the pictures because she probably didn't take the picture and, and, then, uh, and then go back up and, and, and take another one. Um, so this is Nancy in front of her house. And you could see um, things do map on to what um, um, uh, Nan uh, with um, Shelton, Jane Shelton uh, says, uh, where she's you know dressed nicely. Uh, and you can see that here. Here, she, uh, um, when she was younger, she used to attend church with all her children uh, and she'd wear a nice uh, silk dress at the church. You could tell it's a clapboard house. Repairs look like are going on on the roof at this time. This outshed here, remember that I'm going to bring that up uh, in a little bit. The uh, and you could see that that it's actually a two-story house that Shelton does talk about. She um, says that on the the, the the north entrance, the front uh, of the house, makes it seem like it's one story. But when you go around the back, it's a two story. You could see it built into an embankment. And you could see this little piece here uh, of a roof. That's the entryway into the kitchen. And then the kitchen, there's a bedroom next to uh, the, the kitchen. The uh, this is the back side of the house where she is um, reading in her um, that Shelton talks about reading in her favorite spot here. Um, the uh, so think, uh, remember this picture because I'm going to this is the picture that helps us actually locate where the house was back in 2010. Real quick, I'm going to give you an overview and then you'll see this slide. You remember it was kind of smaller before and I blown it up and it, and it's positioned later in the uh, presentation. Uh, so just as a re refresher, 
But here I want you to see the, um, um, the layout of the site in Osborne Dale State Park. And you can actually walk through this uh, site. Uh, there's a trail here uh, where you can walk uh, into, the, into the woods. The, uh, when we first got on the ground in May 2010, uh, and I was, like I said, I was doing my dissertation uh, research up in Massachusetts, but um, the crew down here, Dr. Perry, uh, Jerry Sawyer, Janet, invited me to come out and help them. And so that's how I got started with the project. And we did a reconnaissance of the area in two, um, 2000, May 2010, right before the field school started at the end of May into June. And so our first focus was on a big foundation here that was most likely built in the, after later research and stuff was built in the 1880s. Uh, this is where we put our transects. North is this way, north, south, uh, east, and west. And, uh, and the uh, Osmondale Mansion and the Kellogg Center are down this road uh, here. We um, put transects in here, uh, east, uh, east to west, on the north side and south side of the house. That was going initially to be our, our focus for the dig and looking for um, this house that Quash most likely had lived in and then had passed down to his son, uh, Roswell. And the, um, we did find another foundation above ground over here, which will become the William Oliver House, uh, the eldest son. This foundation here, is not above ground. This is the embankment here that we figure out that a house was dug into this embankment. Okay, so this, before we uh, get started uh, into uh, that very day, um, uh, Jerry Sawyer had gone out there earlier because he lives down in that area. And this foundation just didn't sit right to him. And he looked at the picture, read the Shelton article again, where she, she had talked about it was built on an embankment and, the, um, and it was really a two-story house. And so before we got out there, in fact, Jerry calls that morning and says, I found, um, I found the location of the house where we're going to dig. I was thinking in my head, it was this, but no, it was here. And you could see the wall, the remnants of the wall that are holding up uh, this embankment. So 2010, our focus was here in uh, this region and we were digging in the right place, which uh, I'll talk to you about in the next few minutes. Uh, 2012, the um, excavations went south to what, we're calling now a pound area. Um, it's a three-sided foundation um, that has a lot of modern stuff in it. Um, we used to think it was a barn, but now we think it might've been a pound for to keep animals or maybe equipment in there. And then the midden. Um, we originally thought that the midden was here. When I first started out, I kind of started out as um, um, Jerry and Dr. Perry's assistant. Um, but after a while, that kind of got boring. And we found a lot of surface scatter south of the house that led us to believe that, oh, the midden is here. So I started digging, opening up uh, units to the south of the house that I'll talk, um, talk about later that made us initially think it was the midden. But before, but before the season ended, it petered out and re realized it wasn't the midden, even though we were initially getting a lot of stuff that was coming out of there. Uh, to, um, so 2012, they actually find the midden down here in a swampy area. And it looks like what uh, the, um, um, friend, uh, Mr. Francesco or Frank Pica, who um, arrives at the part of uh, the property after William Oliver dies. William Oliver dies in 1910 and uh, Frank Pica, an Italian immigrant, 
uh, moves onto the property about uh, between 1910, 1915, 1920 timeframe that he might have cleaned out the house, what was left of the house and dumped in a single dumping action, dumped it down here to the south. So 2012 was sent, spent working here in these areas. 2014 moved back up to that big um, uh, foundation, which I'll talk a little bit. I'll talk about these in more detail. Just this is kind of an overview. Um, and then 2016 and 2018 focused on the William Oliver House here. Uh, there are um, different types of stone walls. So there are walls where we think that are uh, specific to uh, Quash Freeman. Okay. All right. So two, 2010, that was the, the start. That was the kickoff of the at the uh, Black Governor site, or uh, now we call it the Freeman Family uh, Home site. Okay. Um, here is that wall that I talked to you about. And here's some of the students. And actually, that's Jerry Sawyer there. And oh, Janet. Oh, and a younger version of me um, pretending to, to be working. Um, but this is the embankment that the house was built on. Okay, two uh, so it's, you can see when you come around the back that it, it was a, a two story uh, house, All right? Here is the front yard area. And so the things we were looking for here was kind of evidence of okay, was the house here? If the house was here, where was the front door? Um, the picture kind of gives kind of an indication of uh, for the clapboard house. Uh, and so we were focused on kind of um, um, looking for the door uh, where we might find windows and a walkway as well. And so we do uncover that uh, very early in, in the process. We find, um, hinges, uh, metal uh, pieces of, of, of metal pieces from the door. We find a lot of flat um, flat window glass and then ceramics. Um, some red wares uh, and cream wares are, are also found and what looks like a uh, what would have been a, a door seal as well uh, and uh, in uh, this area right where we expected uh, to find it. And you could see students down here, excavating in what would have been the kitchen area and then over here, the bedroom area. Remember the shed that I told you about in the picture. These students are looking for the shed in this area. We never found evidence of the shed. And the um, what we think uh, is that it was possibly a shed that was built on top of the surface. And that's why we couldn't find it. Also deep over here, you can, and if you move up this way, that's the, um, the William Oliver house the, uh, in this area up here. So very early on, we found evidence of the door, window, uh, uh, ceramics, uh, the door seal. So this is the front lawn hey, we're digging in the right place. And then excavations down here uh, in the kitchen area and also in the, um, uh, the bedroom area. So as we go, um, uh, as I move on into the kind of this lower area, after a few weeks, we started to uncover a brick conduit that we didn't really know what that was. The we called then a an archaeological, uh, I mean, uh, a architectural historian, and he knew exactly what it was, uh, because the you could see part uh, the, some of the brick conduit here, and some of it ran all the way uh, back uh, towards the the embankment, and he explained it to us that houses that are built into um, into a cliff or, or or an embankment area will typically have conduits so that when the spring thaw comes, that water doesn't get trapped up under your floorboards, that 
these conduits will bring the water out during the, the, the spring thaw. And um, it, it, that cleared up things for us um, um, uh, well. And I remember later that summer visiting some of the UMass students that were out at a tavern and the building was built into the side of, a, um, of an embankment as well. And they came up with the same stuff. And I said, oh, you know what that might be? Um, and then later on in, in the fall, one of the, uh, one of the field directors came back to me and said, oh yeah, it was exactly what you, what you said, uh, because I had seen it in June. So by the time in July, hey, that, 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 that looks familiar. The, there were thoughts that the house um, possibly burned because uh, Frank Pica, uh, being an Italian immigrant, face discrimination by the people around uh, around him. So he um, was was terrorized at times and he will eventually leave, uh, leave the property. Um, there really wasn't evidence fully that the house had burned down. We found one burnt board um, over in um, what would have been the bedroom area. And then in the area south that we open up thinking that it's a um, thinking that it's a um, uh, a midden. Uh, we did find burnt glass as well. We did find uh, an item of burnt glass here uh, as well, um, and then some more down uh, to the south. But that was it. So we really don't um, um, think fully that the house burned, and we think that possibly. What happened with uh, Frank Pika when he acquires the property? He might be using it as a barn because, and we attribute the stuff that we found in the uh, the first uh, levels uh, that are probably him, um, kind of uh, 20th century tools uh, um, and metals uh, that we attribute to him, and then. Uh, we think we got down to the, the Freeman layers um, because uh, we found um, uh, either a brooch or a bracelet and uh, other items, feminine items. Um, and then we find kind of late 19th century, early 20th century ceramics um, as well. Here's kind of another angle of it. You can see it. Uh, here, um, students hard at work, the embankment uh, here with the, the wall that would have been parts, of, a lot of this would have been the, the wall of the house. Um, the, some of the um, other key things, I think, um, I think um, going south to the, um, to the midden area, we found, um, a lot of, uh, well, actually going back to into here, we did find parts to a stove uh, in the kitchen area. Uh, we did also um, south, found, we found a lot of late 19th century, early 20th century uh, soda bottles, a lot of um, broken, um, um, broken bottles, some um, medicine bottles, which we'll find in later years too in the midden, which tells us that there's probably home health care uh, going on. Uh, and for a lot of people uh, at this time, uh, don't um, uh, have access to a doctor. So a lot of people are using uh, home, um, home remedies. And so we do find that uh, actually, interestingly enough, in, um, uh, in this uh, 2010 dig, we find a uh, medicine cure um, um, bottle from the uh, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Spaven's uh, medical um, horse flesh medical cure bottle that we find in 2010 um, on the on the site. The um, which all these little um, cures, you as you all know, they don't really work. Some of the interesting stuff that we um, picked up about the, with um, the, the Spaven um, bottle is that they were, um, the advertisements were kind of very racialized advertisements where they, um, um, which 
uh, kind of fits the time, the 1880s, 1890s, early 20th century, where they're using caricatures of African Americans to uh, peddle products and stuff. And uh, with the thought process being, well, they were domestic, so they would know uh, kind of cleaning products and how to um, um, uh, uh, self-rising pancakes, uh, uh, advertise like Aunt Jemima and stuff, all that is coming out. So it's um, not unusual that the uh, um, that this uh, Spaven uh, medical cure bottle would use those advertisements to uh, entice people to uh, purchase uh, things. Also in that, um, uh, that um, what we thought was the midden, there are also, um, like I said, we found a lot of glass shirts. Uh, we found uh, a lot of uh, ceramics uh, as well. Uh, some non-diagnostics, we couldn't uh, tell what they, um, what they wore, but um, we also did find a um, star water bottle uh, in that um, in that um, uh, supposed uh, 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 midden area, and also um, a poison bottle, uh, and like I said, the soda bottles and other glass bottles uh, were found as well, and also glass, flat glass, window glass was found up on the upper level as well as down uh, here uh, as well. And here's just uh, students from the 2010, which was a very large group. Uh, we don't get those large groups uh, anymore that we used to 11 years ago. So it was a large group of students and then an, uh, a large group of from the 4-H club. And, uh, and some of those young ladies hung out with us the all five weeks um, until one of them caught uh, poison ivy very bad. And then she didn't um, finish the week out uh, with us. But uh, yeah, we had a lot of students and then we had alumni that uh, wanted to um, uh, come back and for a day and, and, and do excavations and stuff. Uh, but uh, times, times are changing. So here's some of those things that I talked about that we found uh, in the kitchen areas, uh, bedroom areas. So burnt uh, metal glass, uh, a, a, a kaolin pipe bowl marked with TD. And then we did find as well two pipe stems. And this is the Kendall Spave and Cure for Human Flesh, uh, which the bottle um, um, dates to the 1880s, 19, uh, 1900s. Now, as we flow south to 2000, we're uh, going to, I'm going to talk about 2012. So uh, this is what the three-sided pound area. And initially the things that are being found here are like auto parts, uh, uh, metal, um, more recent, you know, garbage and metal that uh, it looks like it was being used as a dumping ground. Um, but as we started to, to excavate, um, uh, some of the things uh, fit more in with the time period of the of the of the Freemans from um, um, glass shirts, ceramic shirts um, are found here. Oh, oh, oh. Initially, uh, we were thinking it was a barn, but now we're thinking maybe it was just a pound area where they might have put animals uh, at, or maybe um, just stored uh, equipment uh, in there. The, as I said earlier, Nancy was known to have raised turkeys. In the 2010 excavations around the house, we did find wire, like uh, chicken wire. So maybe that was used to, um, to house um, the turkeys. Um, kind of more analysis uh, needs to be uh, needs to be done um, with that. But this from this area, the team moved over to the east a bit more into that swampy bog and some of the surface scatter uh, led to finding the the midden. Uh, so there's some of the students um, and there's Dr. Perry excavating. I was not out there. Um, for this season, because I was um, going around to my various sites for my dissertation, I did pop out 
to, to visit and see um, what was going on. So this is showing you kind of that swampy area. And it um, looks like it was a single dumping um, that Pika might have cleaned out the house, say with a wheelbarrow and stuff, and dumped it into uh, this area. Uh, some of the uh, stuff that was on the top probably could be linked to him, but then we do see uh, various items um, that um, that uh, might link to females. Frank Pica was not married. He was single. So it might link to um, Nancy and, um, and some of the daughters uh, that were uh, that were living there uh, over over the course of um, the uh, 19th century. Some of the um, of, um, some interesting stuff comes out of, of the midden. Um, a Kickapoo Indian um, oil medicine bottle uh, will be recovered from there. Uh, and I'll show you pictures of some of this stuff. A um, knob cut li uh, um, uh, lid that uh, was either for say a candy dish or a sugar bowl or uh, maybe a cosmetic uh, jar. Um, there's a lot of stuff from um, the household uh, that so that you could see, um, uh, we could see um, that th there's household stuff, but then there's also stuff which uh, tells us that there's, uh, again, that there's um, home health care going on, but also that they are participating in the commercial uh, the commercial uh, economy. Um, so they possibly have disposable income, which takes us back to, to um, for Nancy um, and going to church in her silk dresses as she's always, um, um, and we get this out of the Shelton article that she portrays herself with great uh, grace and elegance. Uh, and that probably comes from her position as being a wife of, a black governor, as well as the daughter-in-law of uh, a black governor. There's also a piece of uh, a stove that I'm going to show you that has a heart symbol on it, and the it, and it's interesting because the um, a heart symbol or a bird with its head turned backwards um, um, harkens to a. San Sankofa uh, symbol, something that the uh, Twa people or in the Akan use in, in West Africa. Uh, and it's um, based on a proverb that says, it is not taboo to return and fetch it when you forget. So what, um, what this most likely, um, uh, well, not most likely, what we're maybe this, we're thinking maybe, could this possibly, this, um, item have been purchased at the stove or the item retained uh, because it um, that heart symbol reminded somebody um, of a um, of a uh, Sankofa uh, um, Sankofa uh, uh, symbol um, because clearly Quash had links back to um, by the, his very name had links back to um, to Africa. Also what's found in the, this midden area are gun flints. Um, the thing about with finding the gun flints though is that um, um, these multiple gun flints the, were past the age of um, uh, flintlock weapons and stuff. So were they used for that? Yeah, we know that, um, that Roswell um, um, liked to hunt foxes, but um, it were kind of past that era unless they had an old um, flintlock. Uh, might the, um, those flints really be used to start fires in the, um, in the, in the kitchen and in, a, uh, in the, the chimney? So um, something um, for us to, to, um, to think about. And here's some of those. So this was the Sankofa, possibly this heart shape that uh, does come from a, a stove. Uh, we found something similar in a um, late 19th century series catalog. Uh, so uh, it could be possibly from uh, that type of stove. Here's the gun flit, 
We also found a hinge tin box that um, was it a cigarette cigarette case or something else? Um, and then this this is that decorative cut glass that um, was it a um, from a, a sugar bowl lid candy dish or or something um, something else? Um, uh, it's um, uh, we don't know, but kind of can be an indicator of possibly into the commercial uh, eco um, economy. We haven't found really um, uh, any tin cans, which kind of um, gives us more indications too of um, purchasing um, uh, weighted items with cans and uh, canned goods uh, can uh, also uh, be ordered from the uh, from catalogs. So we haven't found any of that uh, on the uh, on the on the site as of as of yet. Going back to so I've covered the 2010 here, the Quash Freeman Roswell Freeman House, um, and then uh, so 2010, and then South here 2012 with the Pound and then the Midden. So now we're going to move up to the large foundation um, which. Uh, we thought was going to be the house for Bliss Scott uh, Freeman, uh, the foundation that was built probably around the 1880s. And then we'll go uh, to 2016, 2018 to the William Oliver house uh, that he will actually move into um, a multi-story brick house, not until really the, the, the 1880s, okay? So this is this large formation. There is surface scatter. This is where I told you we put the transects in north uh, and south. Uh, there's chimney uh, fall that you could see uh, within the, the unit, but a nice size foundation that, um, that um, uh, was dated to about 1884. So this is 2014. When the students uh, started their excavations, after the surface scatter was picked up, they didn't find anything in here or around the house, which, um, and I use this a lot of times in, in classes and stuff, and I, I, I will show them this and I'll ask the students, why didn't uh, we find anything here? And also stressing to them that, you know, their research questions that we go out and, and we're looking for, like 2010, we were looking for uh, the, the house. And we've always been looking for the privy, but we've never found uh, the privy uh, in, in all these years uh, of, of digging. And um, uh, so the research uh, question focused here was on the Bliss Scott house. And so uh, nothing was found. So that told us that, okay, no house was ever built on here. And then more research and Janet Woodruff um, is, you know, our chief of uh, research. She found um, that William Oliver, I mean, it's not William, um, Bliss Scott Freeman dies in 1880, uh, 1884, 1885. So there was no time to put a house up on this, um, uh, this foundation. Disappointing to the students because, oh, I didn't find anything, but it answered a, a research question that, oh, there was a, uh, um, uh, Bliss Scott didn't come back to the property. He died, no house was built there. So 2016, 2018, we moved to the east to the, this is the multi, which would have been a multi-story brick house, the William Oliver house. He passes away in 1915, and it becomes the, um, it, um, and then Frank Pika will use it uh, as a house. So in 2016, they do excavations inside of it, and um, a little to the east, uh, up up in this uh, up in this area, the uh, they come up with what, um, uh, and, and it's kind of confusing at times what well, what belongs to, uh, in what room what 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 were these um, different rooms um, again coming up with 
a lot of building materials for both 2014 and I mean, 2016 and 2018, a lot of ceramics, glass, um, uh, ceramic glass, uh, not ceramic, um, bottle glass, and also um, flat uh, glass, a lot of nails uh, and the um, what looks like um, remnants of what might have been a cabinet, um, which led um, Dr. Perry and uh, Jerry Shore to think that um, um, one of the areas might have been maybe kind of like a, a dining room uh, area. In 2016-18, we will um, come back to this location and we'll dig um, what they hadn't dug here in the east, because they did do along here too in 2016, along the west side and a little bit of the east. So we continued on on the east side. And then we went, there's a slope here. We went down the slope and dug some units uh, in search of the privy. Again, we've uh, never found the privy. And then we went south of the house too, which right as we were kind of into our last week, in 2018, we were coming up with um, interesting items that uh, um, um, from ceramics to, yes, yeah, some building materials, but also um, um, metal. Um, there was uh, over here found a 1915, uh, a 1915 um, penny. Uh, we believe that these earlier levels are most likely um, Frank Pica. Uh, uh, those kind of er early uh, early levels down to um, 20, 30 uh, centimeters. Uh, but we think we do possibly get to the William Oliver. And there could still be more, I'm sure of it, more potential here. We it had to end the season in 2018. We were going to come back in July um, because some of the students said, oh yeah, I'll come back, I'll pop back in in July. Um, but uh, the uh, as people started to go on vacation and stuff, we didn't um, get to come back in July. And so in August, we backfilled um, the, um, uh, finished backfilling the areas that we, we put tarps in or coins uh, in and backfilled. Uh, just like we did in other areas, um, put tarps down and, and backfilled so that we, uh, if we ever decided to go back or somebody else uh, can, uh, will go back to get better resolution on these areas uh, here. Um, the, um, we did find, because we were really hoping to find, along with the privy, again, we were hoping to find evidence of women and children, uh, because that kind of eluded us in the 2010 and also in 2012. And we think that there's probably more work that can be done in the midden um, uh, uh, that we could go deeper in that area and move over into other areas too. And that maybe we'll see um, even more of the women at the site and then evidence of the children. Because remember, we know even um, though um, possibly two of them died early that there were children, uh, a lot of children at this site. So it's like, why can't we find the privy? So the we did find a slate uh, and inkwell, two inkwell bottles were found in the midden area, but that doesn't really give us the, okay, that there were children here. Um, we haven't found any um, graphite pencils, but we did find a piece of a writing slate, which might have been a school writing slate with a W in the corner of it. And we're wondering if that was William Oliver's uh, um, slate, maybe it was a school slate, or was it um, his son, William Edward? because he uh, does marry and he has two sons. We know one um, was born in like 1865 and the other one, 1867. We don't know the second son's name that uh, um, uh, has eluded us in, in, in the records. So um, we, that's really the only thing in a ring that we found, uh, which we think are in the William Oliver levels 
that we can link to um, to females and to possibly um, a child. So again, there's more stuff that could be um, for either us or for other people um, um, down the road. And here that you can see the um, inside and the uh, west side that they dug in 2016. I wasn't out there again in 2016. Uh, the I was finishing up the dissertation, um, uh, but I was out there uh, again in, in, in 2018. And here are just, as I'm wrapping up, um, this is the, the Cole family, James Cole and, and family that are descendants of Quash Freeman. Um, coming out to visit uh, the, the site. Uh, and um, the director of the Kellogg Center at that time, Dr. Perry, uh, Jerry Sawyer, uh, both are retired now. The future. So there's Dr. Perry, there's me, there, there's Janet. So I'm wondering if this is 2010 timeframe. Uh, the future, as I've talked to you uh, before, there are opportunities because we didn't dig everything and you and as you all, as archaeologists know, you don't like to, we don't like to dig everything, save it uh, for other people. There is the potential. Uh, we did find on the 1920 quit claim that the road network uh, back then was different. The trails and the paths around the walls and stuff is, is different. Um, and so that could be a possibility. Like I said, hitting that midden um, uh, uh, again that area. There's still work around the William Oliver, the 2016, um, and then also around what we call the quash walls that he most likely built. And, um, and then maybe finding that privy. So there is future work. What's going on now, and we've been stopped at times over the years, and, and, and it's been, so it's been slow going. And then there was a whole shutdown in the lab is um, cataloging, going through the, um, 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 the, the artifact years uh, and getting that stuff um, cleaned up and cataloged. Uh, and we have an intern um, that's been helping, um, helping us do that. Uh, it's, it's been hard going because the lab is also going through renovations, which we thought would have been done uh, by now, but um, uh, like we're waiting for, they did the floor, painted the walls and uh, we're waiting on new shelving, put um, new um, um, table where the students can work and, and, and do analysis. But uh, uh, I guess our shelves are sitting off uh, one of the ports in a, a container ship. So it keeps getting delayed. So there, um, there uh, is still um, um, cleaning, cataloging, analysis going on. There is also um, uh, the Kellogg Center and um, um, we uh, gave them back some of their, their artifacts and they are creating a display down there in, the, in the, um, their uh, environmental center so that people can go and see um, uh, and, and read about the, the, um, uh, the black governors. And we are actually also um, working on a display here on the fourth floor. So that's what the, uh, the future holds, uh, holds for us. So uh, exciting times um, um, for us all. But the, the, one of the big key things is, is to get through all the artifacts that we have, um, um, that we've um, uh, uncovered 2016, 2018, uh, and then uh, move forward from there. So, um, subject to your questions, that uh, concludes my um, my uh, portion of uh, tonight. Um, Great. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I I did have one question. Uh, I saw that there's one in the Q and A, but I'll go ahead and kick things off. Okay. Um, the uh, the search for the privy. Have you guys used any ground penetrating radar surveys yet? I noticed that it was a little bit hummocky out there and maybe difficult in some areas, but uh, have you thought about that? We thought about it and that, um, um, uh, and if we go back out there, 
mm -hmm. we would like to uh, we would like to do that um, yeah. to find somebody that kind of has that equipment and, and and can help us. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So there's a couple of people I can send you some emails. Uh, I know that Deb Sarabia with NRCS works with uh, the Office of State Archaeology. Uh, I also do ground penetrating radar work too. Um, oh, okay. So there's you know uh, a number of different uh, people that are doing it on archaeology focused stuff too. So okay. Um, yeah, it could be really cool. But there's another question I see in the Q and A here. I can read it or you can read it. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, from Thomas Ford. Can you see it or do you want me to read it? Um. No. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll start with Thomas Ford's. I'll read it out loud. Okay. Uh, I'm intrigued with your photo of the hinged tin. Uh, the glass question mark surface appears to have incised pattern, possibly done after manufacture by its owner. Has this been assessed relative to any African-based symbolism? Um, we looked at that and we, we don't think so at this time. Yeah. Okay. And then there was another question in the chat uh, from Sarah Sportman. Uh, thanks, Anthony. That was really interesting. Do you have any information about whether the family you've been researching in Derby is related to the Freeman family in Bridgeport with Mary, Eliza, and Joel uh, at the Freeman houses I, uh, that uh, are there in uh, downtown Bridgeport that Maiza Tisdale works with? Yeah, I think uh, our researcher Janet has um found some um some uh some links yeah yeah to them and um and it, it seems just like the um the cole family are linked in with the De, um with the du bois family the burkharts um, um with um web du bois uh his family and great barrington as well so there yeah, we see these links kind of um across the border uh as well and then uh, remember, if anybody wanted to ask a question in person, I can activate your microphone if you want to do it that way. So you just need to use the raise your hand feature. Uh, let's see if we get any more coming in. Sometimes it takes a minute or two to get them to come in on the chat feature or the Q and A. Um, let's see. So do you have a lot of, uh, Students that are getting so you said the lab isn't open yet, but um, have you been? In, are you back in person now? With yeah, students? yeah, yeah, yeah. And the students are in the lab, so we okay. have the intern is focused on our 2018 uh, uh, Derby stuff, and then um, the other students um, that are taking a lab course are focused on uh, what we dug this past summer at the Chafee House. Hmm. Um, we had to do something close. So that yeah. we could um, um, actually have a field school and sure. and um, uh, uh, yeah, Derby would have been kind of too too long of a track. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And then there's another question from Sarah. She wants to know: Do you have good preservation of plant and animal food remains at the site? Um, no, no, mm -hmm. actually, uh, no, uh, no, we don't. Um, the some non-diagnostic bones, some teeth, which we think are, are cow teeth, but no, we don't have uh, uh, that on on this on this site. Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe if you find the privy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Has anybody raised their hand? I have to scroll up to see. Uh, no raised hands yet. Um, hmm. any other questions? So you guys are you thinking about going back out in a couple of years or, you know, you, you know, um, we kind of um, said um, when the we were going to go back out in 20. Yeah, it was 2020, but mm -hmm. the pandemic. So uh, we, we didn't do anything that year. And then we told ourselves, oh, we um, we got to do something close if they're so if, if they're going to let us go out. It has to be something close sure. where people could go with their own cars. And we kind of told ourselves in our head, I think we're done there. Mm -hmm. But as I was going, as we're in the lab going over the stuff and we're kind of and setting up these dis displays, we're like, wow, I really want to go back out there. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we'll see. Yeah. 
Cool. I guess there's, I mean, you know, you could do, I don't know people that do this, but people, some people have found good evidence with the phosphate studies too, right? To locate privies. Although on a site that's got that many different houses, I'm not sure how, how well that would work either. I think GPR is probably the best bet. Okay. Um, but yeah, phosphates might work too. Um, I don't know. Okay. Well, uh, are there any other questions? Here we go. Uh, Thomas Ford says, thank you. And I think uh, we can all agree with that. It was a really great talk. Thanks for thank uh, you. sharing your research with us. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having us. Yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll, you, you can come back and tell us about the Chafee uh, excavations at some point too. Once okay, you get, yeah. get some time to uh, analyze <laughs> it. I know it takes some time. So Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, wait, there's another, uh, hold on. Okay. Uh, here, uh, Jeff uh, wants to know, can the public hike out to see these foundation? And then thanks for the talk. Yes, yes. It's in Osmondale State Park. It's um, oh. they're hiking trails all, all through there. And, um, and if you can, I don't know when the Kellogg Center will have their display up and running. They came um, sometime in October to pick up some of the artifacts. And um, um, so there will be a little display down there, but yeah, you can hike up all through that area. In fact, while we were out excavating, there were people hiking by, their houses are right across the street. So they walk their dogs over there. So yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Sounds like yeah. a really great opportunity for public archeology span too, than if people are hiking through, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've always um, kind of wanted, and, and the Kellogg Center, had thought about it, um, I guess events and things have gotten in the way of putting some signage up out, out there. Yeah, yeah, that would be really great, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, uh, thanks again for this great talk.